I want to say welcome to uh, late 2023 when we are recording this webinar podcast episode. And as always, this is Dan with Iron Edge, and I want to welcome everybody that's watching us today. We have special guests today, and we wanted to break up the monotony of me and Andrew or Andrew and Patrick. So now we've got some terrific guests today, and, and I want to introduce everyone listening to Solus Security. And Solus has been our partner for um, a couple of years now. And they are, they've been in business over 20 years. Uh, they're in the cybersecurity business. Solus was founded as a cybersecurity consultancy focused on helping community banks throughout the United States get their security programs in place. There's good synergy with Iron Edge because we started with banking as well. Uh, since then, the company has expanded outside the banking industry and has clients throughout the USA and Canada uh, where they provide cybersecurity related services. Additionally, they have an incident response practice, which I find fascinating which works thousands of cases annually alongside its sister divisions in the UK and Australia. So let's see the good, the bad, the ugly, and the really ugly every day through incidents they work and their experience is crucially important to their cybersecurity practice. And from Solus today, I've got Chris Lohr, the EVP and CTO at Solus. And I've got John Rucker who works directly with Iron Edge and he leads their MSP channel program. So guys, you wanna say hi and maybe say a little bit about yourself. And then we'll get rocking. Yeah, sure. So I'm Chris Lair. I'm the EVP and CTO over here at Solace. I get involved in a number of areas uh, throughout the organization. Was really the first customer of Solace's back when it was started oh, wow. years ago. Yeah, from the banking world. Oh, so cool. When people ask me if I've been at Solace for a long time, I've been here over nine years, but I go back to the beginning uh, as part of a deal. So I've seen the interesting. The, yeah, I've seen the journey, you know, just right by face. It's, it's pretty amazing to see it from two different perspectives and be a part of it. What did you do in the banking world? So I was on the IT operational side. Yeah, right on. And, and, and I did that for a bank called Local Oklahoma Bank that was based out in Oklahoma City. It was about okay. a $2.8 billion bank, uh, roughly about uh, 50 something locations across that state okay. around for like 100 years. Pretty big, yeah. Uh, and uh, it was acquired by a bank based out of Laredo called IBC Bank. Okay, and yep that bank operations in San Antonio. So that's how I ended up uh, moving from Oklahoma city to San Antonio. I got called the Oklahoma guy, even though I was born and raised in Dallas <laughs> and I have, okay. you know, like fifth generation Texan, but yeah. I still got labeled that, but that's where really through that, uh, that time period, which was 2003 to 2012, roughly. Sure. That period of time was the big transition for banks, as you know, right. They, mm -hmm. they had, you know, a lot of them, were doing security well that that knew they had to do it, but the regulators really weren't breathing down their necks uh, like they started to then. And then on top of that, you know, being at IBC was somewhat of a unique situation because number one was fairly large bank, you know, at that time was I think over $11 billion in assets wow. okay, based on the border with, you know, with a lot of business in Mexico as well as a publicly traded company. So if you want to choose an organization that basically is under scrutiny, 364 out of 365 days of the year. Yeah. I mean, that yeah. bank was it, not not just just because of who they were and their kind of their corporate makeup. So learned a lot there, built, you know, built out, changed a lot of infrastructure out over there and and, and um, uh, learned a lot of lessons there, but then kind of jumped shipped and came over the service provider world. And, and yeah. that, that's what we're, that's what I'm doing today. That's terrific. I want to make sure I have your name right for everybody listening. Lair. Lair, that's correct. Lair. Okay, so I, mean, I said it with an O in there. You said, you said it. That's it's spelled that way. So phonetically. I yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, only, uh, the only the only people I've ever had pronounce it correctly the first time are either people that are German, okay, or history teachers for some reason. Interesting. Yeah, it's, it's they know it, but no one else is. <laughs> no one else has that. Well, uh, you know what? Uh, a mutual mutual friend. I was talking about this this podcast coming up and you were on it and this mutual friend said, oh, he's a big deal. He's really, really good. You'll love him on the podcast. And I was like, oh, heck yeah. So I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. John, I've known you for a while now. John's terrific. He works directly with Iron Edge on a lot of different things. You want to tell us a little bit about yourself and how you work with MSS, MSPs? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I came on board uh, about a year ago, and really the the main reason was is we were having a lot of MSPs coming to us, asking for uh, us to help them kind of fill out their security practices, yeah. right? So a lot of the MSPs that we work with are really good at IT, but 
on the security side, you know, there's there's areas yeah, where they can do nice. some help. So, sure. um, so we're happy to do that. Uh, the incident response part of our business seems to be where we're getting the most traction, okay. uh, and where we're able to provide, you know, really, you know, instant value out of the box, if you will. So yes. Uh, so that's what I've been focusing on for the last year is really helping kind of build that that out for our for our partners like Iron Edge. Sure. Uh, and you know we we're real focused on staying in our lane, right? Identifying where the the synergies are, and there may be overlap, right? Sometimes with the uh, with the MSPs that we're working with. So we want to make sure that we are focused on the area that provides the most value for the MSP and their clients. Yeah, and and Dan, you you know, but for the audience, we used to have an MSP part of our business, and. Uh... We were acquired a few years ago, and uh, as part of that acquisition, we divested the MSP business and sold it off separately. So, you know, uh, I'm glad that you're doing the MSP side of things because I'm glad I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> but, uh, but at the same time, we know that business really well. It's not like yeah. we're coming in blind. I mean, we lived and breathed it. And I tell you something too is uh, it's been instrumental. You know, over the you know, I have to say I'm happy to say that we haven't had any MSPs call us that have been attacked themselves it's good but you know two years plus back i mean we did have msps who we had to help during incident response situations yes. and our experience with msps and especially with the vendors that the msps rely on really came in handy during those situations and accelerated recovery and and all those other types of efforts so don't want to don't want to miss that uh we know that msp side really well and we respect it and, and we're here as much to educate as we are to to, to do business with MSPs. Yeah, I would say y'all do an excellent job augmenting what we do and providing consultancy re related to any number of issues from, you know, um, solutions for next gen AV products, um, compliance related questions, scans, all kinds of stuff you augment our team uh, with. And I want to, I want to talk a little bit of, we're talking about it right now, but what, what's, what's an MSP and what's an MSSP what we thought a couple of years ago is when we saw when COVID happened and we had to um, basically change the model of how we secured client environments we used to kind of secure the the the, the corporate offices um, firewall and servers and all that stuff. And that was traditional IT for a long, long time. Well, once COVID hit and everybody just kind of scattered and moved all over the world and everybody began to be able to work everywhere, we had to fundamentally change how we approach security for our clients as an MSP. And what we what we realized working through that is there is a real opportunity. What we couldn't provide from a security standpoint, there was an opportunity for us to partner with somebody that were security experts. Like you said at the beginning, we're we're good at uh, generalized IT. We're good at projects. We're good to a degree at security. We're very good at all those things. But now with the way IT is, we really require. Um, we require a partner to bring in a bunch of security related experience and it's super valuable for us. Um, we, I've told my clients for the last several years, we've had to become smart on security. We've had to know in what applications to pull in and what partners to pull in and what systems to pull in. And the reason we've been, been very successful at that is we partner with you to be completely transparent. So it's been, it's been terrific. The relationship is great. And from your perspective, what is, you know, what would you say the difference between an, your old MSP practice and your MSSP practice is, if you could summarize it? Yeah, I mean, so it's a great question. You know, one of the things that we did is we started as a security practice and then we, you know, our clients at the time were like, well, you guys keep criticizing our IT. Why don't you just do that for us? We told them, I think a half a dozen times, no. And then we finally gave in, but you know, but even during that time, and, you know, we were much smaller and we were in the same place, our security team physically set separate from the IT team. Okay. It wasn't like they were behind locked doors or anything of that nature. Sure, sure. But they were, they, there was that physical segmentation uh, just so people knew that, hey, there is, there is a reason why to have two sides of the thing. And I think as, as you know, in the banking world, you, you can't merge the two. And I think that a lot of companies are finally understanding why that is. Right. But I would say what, what we saw the biggest difference was it's just kind of the checks and balances to keep it simple. Okay. For example, the IT side, they're responsible for updating and patching machines. It's okay. a good example. Yep. The security team's the one that goes, yeah, well, you might have said you patched those machines, but they're missing this patch. All right. Or this patch didn't go into effect. So so very simply, you know, kind of the checks and the balances. And the, but if, if you even want to roll it back a little bit more, 
I would say the mindset and, and what I've always kind of described it as is like, look, and, and, and I've, I've lived on both sides of the aisle, mm -hmm. if you want to call it from an IT we're we're focused on uptime, right? Systems down. What are we going to do? We're going to go fix it. We're going to reboot it. We're going to do whatever we need to do. Security mindset is going to say, why is that system down? Was it, was it something technology related or was it something security related? We need to investigate that and make sure before we just start flipping switches back and forth and, and you know, uninstalling, reinstalling and doing those types of things. So it's very difficult to have an individual or even a team be able to think both ways at the same time. So right. when you have that kind of separation, you're kind of assured that you have, you know, two different perspectives. And, you know, in the case with Iron Edge and ourselves, you know, what, what we do together is, is we understand those boundaries and we understand that relationship. So there's no question. We know what you need to do. You know what we need to do. We both talk and collaborate and listen to one another. And that's how things get done. And uh, I think that uh, it's a little bit different or difficult to articulate that, uh, especially to small and medium-sized companies. But I think mm -hmm. they're coming around and seeing the importance of that. Yeah, uh, it's for us to have to us to for us to, as an MSP to augment our team to be roughly equivalent to having an MSSP in-house would be incredibly expensive be really tough people to find. Um, and it would require a skill set that the rest of the company really doesn't have to be transparent. So um, it is incredibly value that, valuable that we can augment with you. Super important. It's the same analogy on kind of like we say to businesses, why our business will come to us and they'll say, well, I don't understand all this. Why is this hard? What is what is going on? Why is cybersecurity such a problem? Well, if you have a small, and I, this is the example I use a lot of time. If you have a small business and uh, say you have one IT employee and you have 75 users, that one IT employee is going to be good at a certain subset of things. They're going to have this, this base of knowledge for about the same cost. You can pull in an MSP that has this much knowledge because they have 50 employees. They have a hundred clients. They have all these different things they have experience with and everything else. And then sort of the same analogy is, is really with pulling in an MSSP for the MSP. So the MSP has this amount of security knowledge, but then you pull in an MSSP that their entire company is built around it. They have multiple tool sets. They have all experience. They then have this much security knowledge. So it's sort of the same analogy I use with a small business on why using an MSP is, is a valuable thing to do. Same thing for MSPs using an MSSP. So don't, don't get, don't fall down the path that you think you're an expert on security. Um, when really you could pull in a whole uh, company of people that are experts um, and they can augment your company normally for a, for a, you know, a reasonable price. It's not out of control. So, um, that's how we work together. That's what we do. So MSP basically is the blocking and tackling the, the, uh, care and feeding of the environment. And then the MSSP is the security overlay that oversees everything and analyzes everything and, and basically attends to anything security related. And they're two really different skills. Um, so I'm going to jump now and we're going to have a discussion here on sort of a summary of interesting things that have happened through this year, things that we can talk about that may happen next year. Um, and so it's going to be an end of the year review and kind of outlook for 2024. And we have several subjects that we're going to talk about. We're going to try to get them in here real quick. We know we can't go two hours. Uh, but the first one I want to talk about and I want to really pose these questions to you all is number one is emerging threats. And those are emerging technology threats. Um what threats do you see that are new kind of upcoming threats that businesses need to at least have heard of and be aware of to look at that may pop up in the future for them? Yeah, it's a great question. So what I would say first is let's just look at the email side of things. I, yes. I heard an interesting quote earlier today, and I need to kind of delve into it a little bit more. But I heard that, you know, today's world, the threat actor that performs fraud through business email is actually finding it a more lucrative business model than someone who does ransomware. And okay. it's a little bit shift. Now I, I need to see where those numbers came from and everything. Sure. So let's just kind of temper it with that. But the point is, is that what the email side of things, the threats that are coming through email and the techniques are, are getting a lot better and they're getting um, they're, they're They look incredibly real. They look incredibly mm -hmm. relevant to the person uh, that's that's involved in the the victim of the attack. Yes, and the amount the amounts of money that we're seeing leave the door, and that people are you know unfortunately losing is is, is continues to grow and grow and yes. grow. 
Yes. I would say the, those email threats, you know, even with multi-factor authentication, it's incredibly important to have that. But we're seeing attackers find ways to to even uh, get around that mm -hmm. or to leverage that. And so, yes. you know, uh, you always got to stay on your top of your toes. If, if you implemented MFA, multi-factor authentication, a few years ago, you probably need to look at that and reconfigure it because there's there's ways of doing multi-factor authentication today to deal with those emerging threats that mm. didn't exist a few years ago. And, and fortunately, the technology providers of those MFA solutions have, have done their jobs and improved their products to deal with that. Now, on the other side of things, I would say, like, look, the vulnerability, uh, uh, threat actors taking advantage of vulnerabilities is the biggest one. Okay. I mean, we still see it. I mean, we have uh, cases that come in that someone's take has taken advantage of a firewall vulnerability. Mm -hmm. that sometimes that firewall vulnerability might have only been out a week. Sometimes it's been out months and it was just never addressed. Sure. I mean, we, we've had cases where a company might have a dozen, excuse me, 20, you know, firewalls and they're all updated except for one. Yeah. Right. So all it takes is that one to get in. So so that's really important. You know, in the last couple of years, there's been quite a few vulnerabilities with uh, Microsoft Exchange on premise. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, people rushed and patched those systems. Right. But what they didn't do was realize that they'd already been exploited. And so even though they patched it, that patching only help them if they hadn't been attacked yet but if right. they had already been attacked the damage had been done the door was open and so people could get in uh just i think today or yesterday actually yesterday there was a a, a release of a vulnerability with chromium which is mm -hmm. part of which is google chrome which a lot of applications use that that have browser functionality uh, i had a, a friend of mine put it best it's like if if you have anything that displays GIFs or JPEGs from an online perspective, it's it's probably vulnerable. So Interesting. there's been some updates about that. But but the point I'm making is, is that's the biggest one right there is the vulnerabilities and, okay. and bad guys taking advantage of those vulnerabilities much more quickly uh, than they ever have been. And sometimes they even like in the case of those proxy show one, the exchange ones, they knew about the vulnerability before everybody else. So they were already in the systems before you even knew you had to patch the patch those exchange servers. It's up. a zero day, right? That's kind of the term used for that. That is that's a zero day. What's interesting about that is I almost say like that's almost like a negative day. <laughs> right. Because zero day usually say, look, this is like right here and now, take care okay. of it. And I think, you know, Dan, that goes back to you talking about the difference between security and and IT. You know, IT says, hey, look, we'll get that patch and we'll get that scheduled during our maintenance window, right? Sure. Security says, Hell no, you're, <laughs> you're going to patch and reboot that stuff right now. Right, uh, it's better to, to disrupt the business than have the dis, you know the bu business compromise. So, yeah, so that you know that, those are the main things we see, especially affecting uh, small and medium sized businesses. For sure, one of the we, we agreed. Um, one of the the business lines that we've started selling in the last in the last year with our with our sort of, we have three tiers of product and the client can get the sort of the medium tier. And that's what most people get. But with our third tier, vulnerability management is added into that tier. And that's relatively new for us. Now we normally, with the care and feeding of networks and computers and stuff, we patch stuff. Um, you know, there's some there's some brackets around when and, and what we patch and what's billable and what's not. But we've added this whole other layer of, of vulnerability management where we, you know, use platforms that, are, that can report on the vulnerabilities daily or basically in real time. And then we sell our clients a bucket of hours to remediate those vulnerabilities just month over month over month over month. And it turns into a program as opposed to like a once a year project to go in and update all of your hardware and everything else. Um, for small clients, I want to I want to call this out for a second. For small businesses, you you may want to ask your IT guy, well, when is the last time you patched your firewall or patched the switches or you know, patched any other piece of hardware? And the answer might be never because it's interruptive. It's kind of not at the front of mind. It's not something that's going to bug you about it inherently. So you do it. Um, and, and when you're at a size where you start to consider an MSP, that's one of the big, big draws for you to move over to an MSP because we can handle those things and we can understand when they need to be patched and we can patch them and all that stuff. Uh, but then to understand the security that's wrapped around all that, that's why we augment with an MSSP. Um, so I would say that um, vulnerability and email based attack still uh, our clients, your clients need to be diligent in understanding how those things work and understanding that their systems are 
are being patched for vulnerabilities, or if they're not, evaluate a plan or establish a plan to get those things done, whether that's partnering with somebody like us, pulling a third-party consultant like Solus or anything else, um, that needs to be front of mind for everybody throughout the next year. I, I love that feedback. You're exactly um, right. We also see real quick, we also yes, see sir. people have old systems that can't yes. be patched anymore. And mm. one of the things that comes up is why is that on the network? And a lot of that's times right. you find out, it doesn't even really... it. There is a purpose for it. So one of the examples sure. we've given, it's been a while, is uh, we had a company that had its own gas pump, right? Okay. And the system they had that managed that gas pump was like a, a Windows 7 machine. Sure. And, you know, that was that was the end of life. Yes. Uh, by quite some time. We had that. And, and, and really, there was, but for them to upgrade that workstation, they would have to upgrade the pump and replace oh, the wow. pump and everything else. So like from, yeah. a, from a business expense perspective, it was prohibitive. But then you say, well, why the heck is it on the network with everything? <laughs> is? Like, yeah. Well, oh, that's a good point. It really doesn't need it. Yeah. We just need right. it there. Somebody right. can walk up to it and deal with that. So right. when you talk about remediation and mitigation, I mean, a lot of times it's, you know, you can patch an update, but other times, you know, you guys have to go in there and say, no, we need to segment this network differently. And we need to, we need to think of things in a different way from the way your network is designed uh, to deal with some of these issues, because it's not always about uh, patching and updating. Yeah, that's, we see the same thing and we see it a lot in apartment complexes. This is very common. They have a computer that manages the gate that opens in and out from the apartment complex. And that gate software is always these sort of small manufacturers make it. And it's always on an old computer hidden somewhere in the back that can't be turned off, that can't be upgraded. It's running Windows XP or something crazy. We see that stuff all the time uh, in that environment. We have to make the decision, okay, can this thing get to the internet? Yes. Why does it need to get to the internet? Normally doesn't. We'll just kind of prevent it from getting to the internet and kind of wall it off a little bit on the network side. But we see the same thing and it's wild. And we have to come in as consultants and say, okay, why is this here? What's the ramifications of it? And then if we had questions of it, we'd go to y'all say, okay, here's the security ramifications. Am I looking at this the correct way? And John would pull somebody in, they talk to me and they go, yeah, I, I think you got it or take this into consideration. Yeah, we see, that's fascinating. We see the exact same thing. We also see it in manufacturing. There'll be some manufacturing machine that has a computer that runs it, same exact thing. Uh, and we'll do a scan at new potential clients. So we'll scan their environment. Like, Why do you have Windows 7 computers? Why do you have Windows XP computers? It's always, always something like that. That's wild. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to take a second, and I know we're kind of jumping, uh, changing topics kind of suddenly here, but I want to talk about compliance and regulations. Y'all are going to be much more knowledgeable uh, than I am. Although I have a lot of banking clients, y'all y'all are involved in compliance and regulations and, and meeting those regula regulations day in and day out. So how important is, would you say, compliance is in a day-to-day -day cybersecurity landscape? I mean, we know it's important, but what what steps should businesses take to ensure that they're compliant? How, how would a small to mid-sized business that may not even know if they're compliant, how would they move forward with 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 addressing compliance issues, how would they how would they tackle that? In your opinion? Yeah. So it's it's for small and medium sized businesses. Most of the time, they don't recognize the need for regulation, regulatory compliance, or anything of that nature until they've been compromised. That's right. And yeah. Right. And, then, and then then they're faced with, hey, what do I need to do? And so right. uh, it's different than publicly traded companies that have to be right. audited, or if you're even a private company right. in, a, in a very heavily like financial services. Mm -hmm. I know already. Um, so, you know, we see that kind of shock factor come in when they find out that, holy moly, I had, um, you know, I've had seven, 800 employees over the last 10 years come and go. And now I've been compromised and I had a spreadsheet full of their benefit information mm. in there. Yes. And now I have to go out and not, we have to go figure out a way to find all these people, figure out what states they live in and then notify them based mm. on each and each individual state's re regulatory Mm -hmm. Right. So, so how they get in front of it, I think it's a two pronged approach. I mean, number one is, you know, having a, a, a privacy attorney, not, okay. not just your general business attorney, but somebody that specializes in this area under you to know, get to understand your business and then, and then talk to you about those different aspects. I mean, it's, I mean, it, 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 it you know, really kind of starts with, you know, how you do business, how your contracts mm -hmm. are, you know, the things that you all agree to, the things that you won't agree to. A lot of small businesses don't think about that. And so that's where a privacy attorney can come in and, and get to know the business and learn the business. And then, you know, from that perspective, that's when, you know, someone like ourselves will come in and do an assessment and try to okay. understand, okay, what is the gap or the gaps that are there 
that need that you need to close. I mean, we've, I mean, you know, we've seen companies, you know, I talk about one that had data that they hadn't deleted since the year 2000 and they right. were, they were involved in healthcare and right. uh, they had, a you know, this is a five person organization. They had over a million health records. Hmm. And so they hmm. had absolutely no concept because if you looked at what they did, they weren't a healthcare provider, right? They were behind the scenes doing some other type of audit and administrative work, but they had the data. And right. uh, you could even say, well, you didn't even need all the data that you had. You only needed a piece of that. Yeah. But they never took the time to step back and go, oh, man, we got a bunch more data than we actually need to do our jobs. They didn't have attorney going, holy moly. I mean, you're a huge risk, you know, from right. many different angles for having all right. this data. So, yeah, so that's where I would say it's kind of a two pronged approach. And then once you have those opinions and recommendations from both the legal side and the security side, uh, then together they can work on a roadmap uh, to get those things done. And obviously, you know, work on the, the high priority stuff and work your way down the list. That's that's terrific. I think um, it's easier for financial services clients because they're bound by whatever regulatory guidelines that they have. And it's just part of the business and they have regs, they have to follow them, they get audited. It's normal operating procedure. But I like what you're saying. You may have a small business that isn't bound by PCI, isn't necessarily, they may, HIPAA may apply, but they're not getting audited HIPAA wise. They, you know, they're, they're, they're not in government and, but they have a business and they're operating and there's no real, there's no real compliance related oversight to a small business. There's not a compliance team. There's no, there's no oversight in that way. So it, I, I, I love what you said. It is wise for them to pull in an attorney to evaluate their operations, sort of establish risk and say, well, how long do you keep data? Where's data kept? Where's it backed up? And all these things. But then also to pull in somebody that's an expert like you, that's a security expert to come in and look at their operations and establish, is this is this generalized IT security best practice? Yes or no? Is it NIST, NIST framework rel, you know, best practice? Those type of things. And then you can come in and you can say, okay, look, according to, you know, you know, our con our consultant's opinion on these things, this is what you would improve in. This is why, this is how you would get there. Here you go. And that's incredibly powerful because you just don't know when you're in a small business, you you, you have no idea. And you you don't have, when you, until you get to 50, 100 people, you don't have anybody that's an expert in it. And pulling in somebody like y'all to evaluate that and provide direction is, is I, I mean, it's invaluable. It's invaluable. That's, and that's one of the things that we're doing more and more of is this incident response advisory program. Yes. Okay. Uh, that really provides that resource for the clients, right? To be able to come and talk to somebody who's been there, done that and seen that, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and has the relationships with 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 lawyers and mm -hmm. um, and knows the ropes. So that's uh, that's been a real valuable asset for for the clients that we're partnering with. Question for you. So can a business go right to you? I assume they can go right to you and work with you directly if they don't have an MSP. Correct. Yes, they can. That's terrific. So somebody could pull you in for those type of things. And it sounds like you have some type of program where they can pay, um, you know, monthly maybe to be part of a program where you're evaluating those things and providing feedback and working on resolving issues and so forth. Exactly. Or they may awesome. have, they may have something that they just find that's suspicious that just needs a, somebody mm -hmm. to go in and quickly triage and yes. say, hey, look, this is, this is fine. You've contained it. You dealt with it. Move on. Or sure. this is a bigger deal. Exactly. Uh, it needs to be handled differently. So yeah, that's what that program is designed for. That's, that's terrific. That's terrific. It's good to know that not only the people that are listening to this, that are in MSP industry can go to y'all and you can augment their MST, MSP, but you know, anybody, any small business owner can go to you and just basically ask questions and get you to review their stuff and provide a program for them to, you know, get that help they need all the time. That's, that's terrific. Um, and really inherent in, to doing that, you're creating your own internal operations and regulations on how IT should work. And that's terrific. Because if you have that in place, you're far, far ahead of somebody that doesn't. No, you're exactly, um, and what people need to understand mm -hmm. too is that, look, there's um, there's ways of doing things that make sense for your business. So right. it's not necessarily like this, this hardcore recipe that everybody has to follow to the T. Uh, a lot of people think that, right? And, and that, that hardcore recipe could be very expensive. Uh, but with the right people involved in in consulting and, and giving recommendations to you, a program can be tailored to to meet those needs of your business without, you know, spending a, a gazillion dollars. That's terrific. 
That's terrific. So it sounds like you can you can evaluate scope and add things, remove things, expand things, and do that to and, and really customize it for anybody that comes to you. Right. And it's not just this pay four hundred thousand dollars, you get this widget, and that's it. So that sounds that sounds wonderful. Um, the next topic, if I can segue into that uh, smoothly, is trends and predictions, um, which is similar to the emerging threats, really. But outside of that, as far as trends and predictions, do you see anything maybe from, uh, you know, the solutions layer that you see that's coming in the future as an example, next gen AV? Mm -hmm. So we jumped on the next gen AV bandwagon in the last couple of years. Uh, I believe that all MSPs are going to be jumping on the, the next gen AV bandwagon and also zero trust. But related to those subjects or any other technological solutions or anything like that, that you think will be a trend that people ad ad adopt in the next few years? Yeah. So I think on next gen AV, you're right. Everybody's needs to move to that. I think mm -hmm. they won't have a, they really won't have an option. I think you're going to see that space consolidate to a certain extent. I mean, there's just a, a lot of different players out there and, and, and a lot of them are good, but I think, you know, over the next couple of years, you're going to finally see some consolidation and simplification in that area for people. But the, um, you know, as you mentioned, zero trust and, you know, and we can really kind of focus on zero trust network access, which I, okay. in layman's terms, I just like to call next generation VPN. Okay. Uh, even though probably the zero trust vendors don't like that term, but, <laughs> uh, but really right. I think it's, it's extending what we've been doing from a security perspective out to these other platforms, whether that's a, a software as a service that you're using mm -hmm. or it's uh, you've, you've moved your infrastructure to the cloud or part of your infrastructure to the cloud. Uh, you know, a lot of times people make sure that they have that security and, and remote mm -hmm. access tied down for their stuff on-prem. Sure. And they kind of defer to those cloud-based companies that they're using these systems from for security. But I think what people are going to see is that they need to have that security uh, blanket per se that they've had over their on-prem extended out. Okay. And then when you talk about the concept of zero trust, I mean, that's exactly right. It's, it's no longer can you have somebody remote in at eight o'clock in the morning and say, well, you have full access to the network for as long as your session is. Sure. There has to be checks. And there's got to be checks throughout the day and throughout, you know, you're working in this platform for two hours and all of a sudden you want to access or something like that. Well, how as a system can I trust that that's you from your device, from your location? And so those things are going to be incredibly important. So I think, uh, you know, that secure access at the edge, which the edge is now pretty much anywhere, mm -hmm. is where you're going to see a, a lot of movement, a lot of focus. I know, you know, I, I, I have a friend of mine that she has a startup where she's uh, basically, you know, a lot of people will find out that their, that their cloud is not secure after the fact. So, you know, her solution comes in and, and tries to get in front of that. So you say, hey, look, we're going to make sure things are done securely, from a, especially from a configuration perspective. Mm -hmm. as part of that migra migratory process. Uh, so you're not, you're not learning it the hard way. <laughs> when, <someone's, laughs> when someone's compromised that cloud, you're like, yeah, well, we were going to get around to security, but that That's was, it. you know, step 25 on the project. Right. Plan. right. I, we see that and it's. It's really disappointing when really your next big initiative is X and then some security event happens and you should have had X done. That's really, I mean, it's it's one thing for you to go in front of your boss and go, well, we were about to do that. You know, that's that's a hard discussion to have. Even if you were, it's really, really hard. And, and you know, it, that's that's tough when, when our clients have to do that. Or, you know, what we see often is we'll take on a new client and that client's literally onboarding with us, which for us, it's, you know, 30 days of prep. And then we turn on the systems and then we move forward for another 30. But what we see during the onboarding process is that client is, is attacked before we've even taken them on. Yeah. You know, it's wild. It's wild uh, about all this stuff. But then the client says, well, I, you know, I made the decision to go with Iron Edge. So that's great. But it's, it's just, it's a wild thing. Um, question for you uh, related to zero trust and the tech and next gen AV. So here's a question. Um, I, I've heard and read some that AI helps to um, is kind of fuels those same things to create logic and to let those things learn and grow. Is that accurate or am I just reading crazy stuff? No, it's definitely accurate. But what I would say with what AI is really um, beneficial and when I would still say this is kind of early from where we're seeing AI being applied. Okay is that, you know, it's helping tune out the noise. So that's okay. always the challenge, you know, you get a thousand alerts coming in yes. and you're like, well, 
holy crap, I have to go through all a thousand of them. Am I going to yes. go through 900 of them and find out I missed the one that I should have been paying, to, paying right. attention to? So I think that's where AI is going to come in. And I also think AI is going to come in um, and you're starting to see this where it may not actually be doing the task, but it may be recommending a task or okay. you know a, a couple of options to somebody to say, hey, look, this particular situation looks like this, feels like this. Uh, we, we, we recommend you do one or two of these things and then that sure. person can then re, you know make that make that judgment and i think over time you'll see it get a little bit more automated but i'm i'm yet personally to trust ai to go that next step of just automating kind of self-driving if you want to call it that yes. because uh it could it could it could do more damage than good so you, sure. you still need that human set of eyes to sit there and kind of translate what that ai is telling you and that and take a you know make a decision on that, but I think um, it's going to shorten the time for that person to make a decision. And again, it's going to allow the people that need to be looking at the things that matter be able to focus and and on those things that matter and be able to ignore the noise that a lot of these things generate. That's a think, terrific. You know, speaking of AI, I think the big yeah. concern on you know the chatter is is the bad actors leveraging AI mm -hmm. To continually improve and come up with new ideas and new ways to to compromise our clients. Well, so that's that's that's, that's exactly good point. I mean, the, the, the big tools that are available to us on the good side are available to them on the bad side. Right. And John has made a good point: is you know, if you you almost need to use you know, let me say almost, you do need to embrace AI because you're going to need it to be able to fight that battle. Because if they have AI and you don't, they're going to have a leg up. Mm -hmm. so. Uh, that's a very good point, John, about, about, you know, we think about AI from how it can benefit our business, but we also need to be thinking about how it can disrupt or even that's right. potentially destroy our business. Terrific feedback. Uh, I wanted to call out one thing that you said that, that's very valuable to us. So we have the, and I think most MSPs have this issue where they receive 10,000 alerts a night across all of their client machines and everything else. And it's up to their service team or they're not to go through this thing and be like, I don't know what, what can be deleted or I don't know what's important or I don't know how to find what's important. That's a really big problem for MSPs, no matter the size. And once you turn on a bunch of systems, that just happens. Um, so what we do is we leverage y'all to, to go through that stuff and to pick out the, the things that need to be remediated or acted on or whatever. And then you notify us. And that's a huge value add. That's really, really important for us because we, we just were getting overwhelmed in alerts from different systems. And that's something that y'all y'all do for us. And that's terrific. That's well, terrific. I mean, you bring up a great point. I mean, we see examples of where, you know, somebody that's been, you know, they come to us because they, they're under a live attack. Mm -hmm. We start to dig into from a forensics perspective and we see an alert from months prior. I mean, we're talking six, nine months prior. Okay. And that alert was just not investigated enough, right? They right. thought, well, we took that machine offline and mm -hmm. we re-imaged it. Well, no, that, that was just a single alert, and that's a very easy kind of conclusion to come to. But if they would have taken the time and even you know had somebody like us kind of dig a little deeper, we would have said, no, someone has completely compromised your network. You don't realize. Mm -hmm. Most likely, they've compromised every password in your environment. You need to take more steps than just you know handling that one workstation. So, so you're right. I mean, it is um, you know you can't you 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 got a lot of times something may seem more simple than it actually is and having someone like us run you know ride shotgun yeah. alongside your team working together you can make sure that you know we're watching your back and while you're yeah. watching your clients backs it's exactly That's kind right of what differentiate solace i think from a lot of other security providers is because of our experience with with incident response and all the cases that we handle you know we have we're, we we catch things we're able to see things from that perspective yeah. Um, because we've been doing it for a long time. Yeah, I mean, you can read all the books in the world, but it doesn't add up to the experience of seeing it real world. Yeah, exactly absolutely right. right. Yeah, I had the exact uh, discussion with a client earlier today. I was in their technology committee and they asked me a great question. They said, can can your team somehow take the content of an incoming ticket and make these things sort of automatically happen from the content? I said, not really. I said, we have to have somebody that sees it, reads the ticket detail, can think, oh, that may be this thing I need to go look at it. That that human component is just in IT. Whether I'd like it to be or not, it's always going to be there. There's always somebody somewhere that has to look at something. And goes, no, we need to escalate this. This is a problem I saw ten years ago. Whatever. Yeah. Um, exactly. But that's AI 
may help call those things out in the future, but it's not going to replace the human component of it. No, you're, you're right. Well, gentlemen, uh, this has actually been a lot of fun and the time went by very, very quickly. And, and we would love to, to work with you on more of these in the future. Um, I can speak from all of us at Iron Edge, y'all are a terrific partner. And I suggest any MSP that's looking for an MSSP partner to, to give you a buzz and, and kind of chit chat with y'all and any small business, I would be comfortable, uh, saying, you know, go to, go to John, go to Chris and, and, and talk to them about what they can help you with. Well, um, we're here where we, 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 we. We're working all the time, whether we like <laughs> I bet. <laughs> uh, you can call us at two o'clock in the afternoon or two o'clock in the morning. Right. We're going to pick it up. Yeah, so that's right. Thanks. That's thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Dan, for having us. I mean, you guys are, y'all are awesome, great. Dan. It's, it's a pleasure working with Iron Edge. Um, you guys are great. Thank you very much. And I want to tell everyone, thanks for watching. If you have any questions, comments uh, that you want to drop in the chat below this, please do so. Or you can reach out to us in any number of ways. Uh, you can find our information on our website, on our YouTube. You can look up Solis Security. That's S-O-L-I-S Security. And you can get a hold of them. And, if, you know, I will um, cut this thing off now and I will see you all in the future. So thank you. Bye, everybody. Take care, Dan.